We're going to be looking there first. I know it's really kind of cool because we still got a hand up over here too. You need both or scripture one. Excellent. And we got it over there. Everybody that wants it, has it. Yes? Perfect. And it's cool because I know a lot of you have your Bibles on your phone, which is so cool, or on your iPad or whatever that is. But if you don't have a Bible, I really want you to follow along. So if you didn't raise your hand earlier, but you'd like to follow along the scripture, raise your hand, I'll give you a Bible. Do one Bible up here. That's it, we'll be good. And we're in Matthew chapter 24 is where we're starting. And my friends back there, can we just put up the whole the fill in the blank for the first four, five, whatever it is, for the major event number three, who went where, why? There you go. And so we got that up there. Who? The conquering Christ. It's the battle, or major event is the second coming of Christ, the battle of Armageddon. The who is the conquering Christ, going after seven years of tribulation. Where on earth? In Palestine, why? To defeat evil and establish peace. And what happens? Jesus wins. That's what happens. But Matthew chapter 24, I want you to take a look at that. We're going to start in verse 3 because I want you to see some things. If you remember last week, we talked about how that, in, in the timeline, I want you to understand, there's a lot of this that isn't set. We don't know the times. These are things that we believe, and there's a lot of difference even in believers. Remember, there are those that are pre-tribulation, meaning they believe the rapture happens before the tribulation. There are those even, even here in our midst that are mid-trib. There are some that are post-trib. Um, so it's like our front row is our mid-trib crowd right there. <laughs> so, you know... <coughs> Um, but it's really funny because remember we thought and they're like, yeah, they still hope we're right. Yeah. You know, and I thought, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, we don't want to be here for it, but uh, we'll see what happens there. But what I want you to see this is, is some of the things that happened before the second coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ is not the same as the rapture. The rapture is where Jesus comes down into the clouds and then we rise up, meet him in the air, and then we go to heaven to be with him. The second coming is when Jesus actually comes down to earth. There is that last battle, the battle of Armageddon, which we'll take a look at briefly, and then he sets up his rule and reign of a thousand years here on the earth. In Matthew 24, starting with me in verse 3, it says, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, they said, when, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said, Watch out that no one deceives you, because many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. Now that scares me because over the last 20, 30 years I've actually seen that more and more. People that are claiming to be the Messiah. People that are claiming to be um, God's son. They're, they're the new religion. They're the new ones to follow. And there's these little things starting up all over the place. And we see that. It says they'll claim that. They'll deceive many. He says you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well that doesn't happen anymore. So it's, yeah. <coughs> Non-stop. Wars and rumors of wars. And it says, but see to it, you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but that is still to come. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all of these are the beginning of birth pains. And I know, it, I, I don't know the accuracy of this, but it seems like everything is getting more extreme. That when the earthquakes come, they're bigger. That when the, the uh, hurricanes come, they cause more damage. Even the extreme of the little things of the weather, you know, you got the whole global warming thing. I'm not choosing sides. I don't know what's accurate on that or not. But here's what I do know. Last winter, it was really cold here. This winter, it's really warm. And, and they're, they're blaming it on El Nino and then La Nina, which is funny because that's the Spanish for the little boy and the little girl. I'm like, why they got to blame it on the kids? I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, they, they have names for all these different things. But what I know is that there's these extremities that we've seen in the weather and in catastrophes and things that are going on. And it says this in verse 9, it says, And then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Now, I want you to keep in mind to be praying for people that live in other nations because that does not yet happen here in the United States. Occasionally you hear about some guy that says he was arrested for his faith. And, and usually I check it out, and usually they're not arrested for their faith, they're arrested for being stupid and breaking the law doing something. You know, I, there was a few weeks ago there was this big ruckus <clears throat> because these people that were having a house church were, were the police actually came and said you can't have this house church and so the Christians a lot of times we want to get all of an arm about the, the, the government is so evil and they, they hate us and actually what it was is 
in that community, there were rules that were set out, and they had gone to the community. The community said, no, you can't do this without a permit. If you get a permit, you can eat in your house all the time you want. And they're just like, we don't have to get a permit. So they broke the rules. So, you know, it, it's sad that sometimes we get all up in arms. But we don't see a lot here. But around the world, there are Christians that are being thrown in jail simply because they're believers. Simply because they mention the name Jesus. There are people that are getting killed simply because they love the Lord our God. And it's sad, and it's happening more and more. And we don't hear about it a lot. We're protected from that. But it totally happens. And it says, at that time, many will turn away from the faith. And they'll betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Haven't we seen that? It seems like people are indifferent. I know that the news thing, the guy that um, totally abused the young lady and then took his life. And, and I was talking to my father-in-law, who, by the way, thank you for your prayers. He's doing much better. He's back at uh, home in Laurel Park, and he's doing okay. But he, he was, uh, the little TV was on in the hospital room. He's watching. He says, what's wrong with me? You know, people are doing just things that years ago we never would have heard of. And the atrocities, and it's getting bad. And then I want you to see this. It's interesting because it says, he who stands firm to the end will be saved. A lot of people try to make that standing firm to the end a condition for salvation. It's not. This is telling you, look, this is a time that there's going to be a lot of persecution. Keep standing firm. There will be salvation at the end. Stay strong because you will be saved. And so keep firm in the faith. And then it says, and this is the gospel, excuse me, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So Jesus is stating that these are things that are going to happen before he comes back, before he starts the end. One of the things that I find fascinating is this fact, is that the gospel will be preached in the entire world. You know, until a few years ago, we really didn't even have the technology for that to happen. Right? And we used to say, oh, there's TV and things like that. But now, with just all that's out there, with the internet, with cell phones, with other things... And friends, it's, it amazes me, and I, I did this at the other church, it surprised me. You ever seen the picture of the guy in Africa, he's wearing nothing but, I don't know what to call it, his tidy whities You know, he's, he's got a little, little thing on there, and, and he's out in the field, and he's got his staff, and he's standing there with like his foot like this, you know, and he's just watching the things on his cell phone. I've seen those pictures, I don't know if you have. It, it, it's gotten everywhere, there is no reason now why the gospel is not reaching the entire world. And that's something that the Lord said would happen before the end. And I would imagine years ago, people wondered, how would that possibly happen? That everybody in the world would hear the gospel. And we see that that would happen. But all these things are going to happen before the Lord comes back. Now, the battle, uh, turn if you would with me to the book of Revelation. We're going to take a little look at this battle. And I think I told you last week that it's not much of a battle. Revelation chapter 19. Revelation is the last book of the Bible. So you go all the way towards the back. Revelation chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 7. Verse 7. Wow. <laughs> verse 11. I was out late last night. But we had a good time, didn't we? We did. We, we, uh, we were at a magic show at the main campus, and um, the guy's absolutely hilarious. And uh, we, we laughed for, for a very long time. He, he did some things that are very questionable. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but really funny. Not bad questionable. We, like, he'd get a little kid up there that's a volunteer, and he gave them some scissors. He says, okay, now go run. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> and then he was told not to run with scissors. And then he, he lights something on fire, and he says, now kids, don't do this at home. Do it at grandma's. <laughs> and we did that. We laughed. You know, I was like, dude, that's funny, though. Then, verse 11 of Revelation 19. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war, his eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. There are so many things right there that tell us, that's Jesus. His name is faithful and true. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. His garment dipped in blood, and we know that he shed his blood for us. 
the one who's crowned with many crowns, name above all names. It says, the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen and white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Remember, if I mentioned to you, that's basically just his word. The scripture says that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It refers to his spoken word as a sword often. We remember that at creation. He said, let there be light and there was light. <coughs> and he said, let there be an earth and separate this from that. And it happened. That his word is so powerful that he talks and it happens. So that's his weapon, is his word. So it says, out of his mouth came that sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in the air. By the way, it gets kind of nasty right here, okay? So work with me, it's kind of graphic. And so the angel's crying out to all the birds, come gather together for a great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and generals and mighty men of horses and their riders and the flesh of all people, freedom, slaves, small and great. Basically, what he's saying is the Lord's about to destroy the army that's coming against him. And there's going to be a lot of dead bodies. So it says, Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on his horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. And with these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. And the rest of them were killed with the sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And then all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. That is what people refer to as the Battle of Armageddon. Not much of a battle, is it? All these armies come to fight against Jesus. And I know last week I said, who got you? But who knows what Jesus says? You know, I was seriously thinking about that. What would Jesus say? See, if Jesus were one of us, we'd be like, I rule, and it'd be over. I'm the king, it'd be over. And it hit me, I wonder if Jesus' last words for these people to hear wouldn't be, I love you. I don't know. Because you know Jesus does love. And that's why it's so hard, because we picture God as love, and we forget that he's also a holy God. And he's a God of love, and yet he's holy. And so this time is the time where he says, look, it's over. And we're not going to put up with this anymore. And I still love you, but you can't come up against me. So who knows what the words he would say that would be the end. Battle of Armageddon. Follow along with me in verse 1 of chapter 20. It says, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. This is what we had mentioned where the, the devil will be cast into that bottomless pit for a thousand years. Jesus will rule and reign for that thousand years without the devil having any say. And so it will be a time when Jesus is totally in charge. But it continues on if you go down to verse 7 with me. Down to verse 7 of Revelation 20. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison. And he'll go out and deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. Now, I've got to mention something here. Because there are a lot of theologians that will tell you who Gog and Magog are. We don't know. And there's a lot of people that like to read things in the scripture. Here's what we do know. That it's a representative term of those that come against God. If they're actual nations, I don't know. I've had teachers and people that will tell you what nations they are. Um, some of those nations don't exist anymore, so they're probably wrong. But, you know, it, it's just the point of people that are evil and are against God, and they gather them for battle. In number, they are like the sand on the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city of love. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Final battle. Again, not much of a battle. The devil is set free. He deceives people. They gather an army. They come against Jesus. Fire comes down from heaven. It's over. It says in verse 10, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. And they will be tormented day 
and night forever and ever. So now I want to talk a little bit about judgment. And so if you guys can put up the judgment, what's going on with that, the major event number four, Judgment Day. Question? Um, I guess I remember reading somewhere that like, there are some people are still having kids and stuff. Yes, absolutely. So are the people that have just saved like, the new babies, like the grown up, or is it still Christians? Only? Yeah, no, 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 it's not Christians. And that's, that's why I mentioned before, which is so amazing to me, because it starts, the millennium starts with only Christians. Because, because all the unbelievers are, are gone. So the millennium starts with only Christians. They're having kids just like we are. Jesus is ruling on earth. There is no devil. And yet still, because of our own base humanity, at the end of a thousand years, generations and generations and generations, I mean, for us, a thousand years, and keep in mind, that would take us back to, what, the 1100s? Medieval times? It's a, it's a long time. In that period, people will grow up that still won't worship the king that is right there. And those people, I think, are going to be deceived. I don't believe it's going to be believed. And so that's what's so amazing is that there will be so many people that will be able to be deceived and turn against God. And that's a sad thing. So then we have Judgment Day. Now, I've got to tell you a couple of things about the Judgment Day. And then those of you that can't see that, Judgment Day, who's judged? Believers and unbelievers. How are we judged? Perfectly and righteously. We are first judged according to who we are. Then we're judged according to what we've done. Believers receive rewards, unbelievers receive wrath according to their deeds. Now here's the thing, I believe that this is why a lot of people used to think like I used to think. I, I didn't know anything about God loving me, uh, that Jesus died for me, that he rose again for me, and that by trusting in him I would have eternal life. I didn't know that. I thought if I was good enough I would go to heaven, and if I wasn't good enough I wouldn't go to heaven. And I didn't like the alternative. And I thought that there would be some kind of judgment, maybe a scale, and all the good works placed on one side, and all the bad works placed on the other side. And it would, it would be measured, and whichever way the scale would go would determine my destination. And fortunately, God is not like that, because he is a God that demonstrates grace. <clears throat> and it is by grace that we're saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. So if you have received that gift through faith, if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you don't need to fear. But there are judgments. Now, what I, I believe that there are two different judgments. One is for believers, and one is for unbelievers. The scripture talks about the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. And I believe that they are two very different judgments. The judgment seat of Christ, and if you have a little piece of paper with the verses, it's all in there. And I think Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians 3 is one of the big passages there that tell you about the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ is we're, we're going to be judged according to our works. I am so looking forward to that, and I am so not looking forward to that. Does that make sense? Some of you maybe can relate. I'm sure there's some of you out there that are just always spiritual all the time, so you are just totally looking forward to that. There may be some of you that are totally not looking forward to it at all. I think it's going to be great. Now here's what i got to do again, is I have to take my mindset out of God being like me. Being like us, if you will. Because if I were the judge, at that judgment, I, I'm sure I would be like, see, you really blew it so many times. <laughs> and it could have been so much better for you. Now here's rewards, and you did a great job, and I'm so excited for you, but really, fortunately, in Christ, there is no condemnation. So even, that includes the judgment. So I don't believe that Jesus is going to be like, really? I think we'll see it. And I think we'll be reminded. But I think it, it'll be his time to say, look, look, these are the rewards you're getting. Thank you. Because he's just way more better than I am. Because that would be my last chance to say, come on. But I think the Lord's going to, there's going to be a time of reward. And we can look forward to that. I remember hearing about that as a teenager. And hearing people say that the greatest thing we'll be able to do then is to take our rewards and to lay them at Jesus' feet. And being a typical teenager, I was like, no. I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to, those are my rewards. Those are for me. Fortunately, in heaven, I'll be way better than I am now. And it wouldn't surprise me that when we get to heaven, that God will graciously give us rewards and our love for him will be so great we'll say, it's yours. You deserve it all. I don't deserve any of this. Because heaven is going to be so great we won't need all those things. But there are judgments. One is for believers. 
the others for the unbelievers. If you, if you continue along with me, we're still reading. Go to Revelation 20, <coughs> verse 11. It says, Then I saw the great white throne, and him who was seated on it. So that's where we get that. Now, <clears throat> and it goes on, Earth and sky fled from his presence. There was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Now notice, it's referring to the dead, and we're never referred to the dead. The judgment, and, and this is, now I'm going to share my opinion as well. I believe that there's even degrees of punishment in hell. Here's why I believe that. Because of the great white throne judgment. What would be the point of that? If hell is the same for everybody. I think the greatest pain in hell will be separation from God for all eternity. And there will be people there, all the people in hell will be separated from God for all eternity. But I do believe that for many it's going to be torments forever and ever. And for some, maybe those torments won't be as bad. <coughs> I don't know why else, why God would be judging them according to their works. Because, you see, folks, our destination is already determined. The judgment is not to determine whose we are. That's already set. When you place your faith in Jesus as your Savior, you belong to God and you will be with Him forever. If you have rejected Jesus or simply chosen not to trust in Him, then you will be separated from God forever. But there are these judgments that come based upon that. But I want you to see even beyond that then in, in chapter 21, <coughs> look at verse 1. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. This is interesting to me and this is what we believe and it's on your little um, sheet of the new heavens and the new earth. God is going to start all over again with believers who are now perfected through Jesus Christ. And there's a new heaven and a new earth where we will live for all of eternity. I don't know how great that's going to be. But I'm looking forward to it. Now because I am the way that I am, here's what I'm hoping to. I'm hoping that we can totally kind of like, you know, just go from one to the other. You know, hang out in heaven for a few billion years and then hang out the earth for a few billion years and then go back to heaven and go back to earth. I, I don't know. Plus the whole fact that I can't comprehend forever. Here's what I can tell you. If you've ever sat down and truly contemplated eternity, you've probably come to that point in your mind is, what am I going to do forever? It's got to get boring after a while. <laughs> That's the cool thing about God. is because it will never be boring. It will always be great. I cannot, I can't get that into my mind. I can't even get, I remember as a kid, and when I was first told that, that the universe went on forever, yeah, it was a lie, but that's what I was told. <laughs> and so I would picture it going on and on and on and on, and, and, and finally in my mind there was a brick wall. There had to be an end. And then what was behind the brick wall, or nothing, or you know, forever. But we will be happy forever. You will never have to go to the hospital again. Woo! No braces, no sore backs, no pain, forever. Here, here's what's really cool, because it goes on. Sorry, I got carried away. And it says, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men. He will live with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things has passed away. It's going to be totally different. Now, I'm going to tell you another little advertism, an opinion I have that's different from most. It's an opinion... I think, personally, I think that sometimes in heaven, now, there is still sadness. I don't think that sadness is sin. I think heaven is perfect. I don't know if those in heaven can look down and see what's going on on earth. But I'm confident of this. If they can, there's got to be sadness. 
and I wonder, I don't know if it's angels or those that have gone, I wonder if my boy can look down and see me sometimes. And when I lose my patience and get upset with my wife, and I wonder if James is like, oh, Dad, I wonder. And here's what makes me wonder that, because it's at this point, at this point in all of eternity, after everything's happened, now the Lord says, I will wipe every tear from their eye. And there will be no more sadness, no more grief, no more pain, no more death. I look forward to that day when it will always be good. Now, what I'm real excited about now, and it's, it's a total shift, but I want you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, if you would. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it is in the New Testament. After the book of Romans, you have 1 Corinthians. Because what we're going to do now is we're going to spend some time in what we call communion. Those of you that are on Facebook probably saw what I put on our little uh, community Petri City page. Look forward to spending some quality time with Jesus and his friends tomorrow. Because communion is that. It's quality time with Jesus and you are his friends. The Bible says, Jesus says, if you do what I tell you, you're my friends. So I get to hang out with Jesus and his friends. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I want you to start with me in verse 23. The Apostle Paul is writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on that night, he was betrayed. He took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then the next verse says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Three things there that I think make up what we call the Lord's Supper or Communion. One is remembering. We remember the Lord. The other is that reflection, and I've never done this before, but they're all ours. I felt like such an old school Baptist preacher of making them all ours. But we remember the Lord. We reflect on ourselves. Do you see it says that Whoever eats this bread and drinks the cup in an unworthy manner is guilty of sin. Well, we're all unworthy. But the Bible also says that when we confess our sins, He's faithful to forgive us our sins. And so that's why what I want to do is, is while we're passing out the bread, and, and guys, you can go ahead and do that. And, and while we're passing out the bread, I want you, as soon as I stop talking, to take some time to reflect on your own sins. Confess to the Lord. Get right with God. Start all over again. A fresh new beginning. God calls us to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to before we come together. So what I want you to do right now is do that first of the R's. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to be quiet. And during this time, I want you to reflect on your own life, clear some things up with God, get it right, and then we'll participate together in the This is my body. This is broken for you. And you just remember to. Lord, 
Lord, we come to you broken. When we come to you hurting. All of us are in hell. But Father, you heal. Amen. And you bring healing. So although we are unworthy of our own through Jesus Christ, we can come to you. Worthy. Because you see Jesus' righteousness. Thank you for the cleansing that you give us through Jesus. Not just temporary, but every day for all of eternity. We are grateful. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. At this time, we'll be passing on the juice in the cup. And I'd, I'd like for you to remember. Remember what Jesus did for you. But it's not just a time to remember. That's where I like the last part where he said, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. <clears throat> Communion is also a reminder of the return. And that's very exciting. The Lord is coming back for us someday. So spend some time. Remember what the Lord has done for you. And thank him that he's coming back. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The old covenant, the people had to go through the priests, through sacrifices to get to God. In the new covenant, we go directly to God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so he says, take this, and whenever you drink it, remember. Father, help us to never forget the sacrifice. Thank you that Jesus is indeed coming back. We look forward to that return. We look forward to joining him in the skies. And Father, now as we are about to receive our offering, I pray that we look forward to giving back to you <clears throat> out of gratefulness for what you have done for us. Helps to always live a life that is pleasing to you. As we receive the offering, just a reminder, if you're visiting with us, please do not feel compelled to give anything. We just want to share with you, and uh, that's important to us, and those of you that come on a regular basis know what to do. And now, here's one more.